imagine uh, you're a government uh, statistician or policy maker and you're visiting the OECD uh, website, which is an organization that helps us compare how the German education system is comparing with the UK or the Irish. So they, they help us uh, compare countries uh, at a statistical level or a policy level. And uh, you've got this survey uh, has popped up when you've arrived at the OECD website. And it asks you to look at the following list and, and choose the five reasons you come to the OECD. And you look at it, yeah, and you, you can see, oh, there's three or four, and you scroll down and you see, wow, there's, there's more. Uh, and then you scroll down and, and there's, there's more. And, and you have to choose five from this. And you're scrolling down uh, further and there's even, there's even more. And, and it's going on further. And, and, and then finally it ends about six screens uh, later. Uh, would you do that? No. That's what everybody says. I mean, I've, I've asked thousands and thousands of people uh, uh, this question, and they all say, no, I mean, it's, it's like, no way would I, would I ever uh, do that. And that's, um, you know, a, a lesson I think Liz was talking earlier. What people say and what people do is often totally uh, different things, because uh, this... Uh, type of survey has been done at least 500 times, 500,000 people voting in over 40 uh, countries, uh, and it worked. It has never not succeeded. It has never not worked. It seems totally counterintuitive, and this is the thing about the modern uh, world. In a world of complexity, your gut instinct is one of the worst things you can depend on, because gut instinct depends on, on past behavior patterns, and complexity is uh, really about uh, patterns that are new and patterns that you're very unfamiliar with. So uh, basically, what you think is often the worst solution uh, to any problem. I often say the worst way to design a website is to have five smart people in a room drinking lattes. And the longer they're drinking the lattes, the worse the website becomes. <laughs> and the next worst way is to have 15 customers in a room drinking lattes telling you about what they really want. Because what they really want is what they rarely, if ever, do. So anyway, uh, 2,000 people did this. Uh, survey. Uh, 2,000 people voted in that a horrendous list, and they chose uh, five out. There was basically about 70 in the list. And this pattern has repeated 500 times, whether it's Brazilian uh, consumers or Icelandic doctors or uh, Rolls-Royce engineers or IKEA shoppers or people on the BBC intranet uh, or people uh, buying stuff from IBM or on Google. Uh, Google have used this method. Every single time this pattern uh, occurs. Basically, uh, this is the vote, uh, the four quarters. So the yellow is the first quarter. So four tasks get as much of the vote as the bottom 49. Uh, in, in, in the process. So typically it's 440 or 550 or some, some sort of a, a, a pattern like that. So in any um, uh, environment, or whether it's dealing with health or, or uh, buying a car, uh, it, there's a relatively small set of stuff that's really important. And there's an awful lot of other stuff that's not that important. And what we find is that when we analyze this behavior and we look at organizational activity, there is an inverse relationship. So the more important it is to the customer, these top tasks, country surveys, compare country statistical data, uh, they're often doing not all that much uh, about, they're not creating all that much content. And the less important it is, the stuff that's uh, the 49, they're producing much more stuff on. There's an inverse relationship. The more important it is to the customer, the less the organization is doing. The less important it is to the customer, the more the organization is doing. And this is what I call the tiny task syndrome, which is out at the end, those 49 uh, tasks. Because when a tiny task goes to sleep at night, it dreams of being a top task. And it wakes up in the morning and says, one of these days I'm going to be a top task. If only I could produce more content. If only I could become the feature that gets on the home page. So most of your life, uh, professional lives, uh, uh, relate to being nibbled to death by tiny tasks. You know, 
because they're constantly at you, nibbling away, and they're not totally vicious all the time, but they're saying, please, 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 can I get at the top of the structure, etc., etc. And most of our time are spent warding away these tiny tasks, and then we've very little time to optimize and actually continuously improve our, our top tasks. So this is a method that not just tells you what is important, but it tells you what is not important. And you need to have a, a relationship uh, between the two. So Europe is a very complex place, the European Union, et cetera, et cetera. All, all the countries are uh, very different. They've got, all got very different needs, et cetera, et cetera, except they don't. You know, uh, complexity is interesting because organizations think that they're far more complex than they actually are in, in, in many ways. Sure, they've co got, got complexity, but they, they love to say, oh, no, we're different, and our customers are totally different. And, you know, Lithuania, the way Lithuanian citizens operate is different from Italian citizens, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So we did a big study with the European Union back when the UK was uh, still a member uh, in 2014. Uh, and we asked uh, citizens wh what is a, and businesses, what is it you need from the European Union? Uh, wh why do you come to European Union websites or deal with European Union officials? And the results were that basically everybody was the same. Everybody had the same tab. Remember yellow is the top 25%, green is 25 to 50%. You know, we're seeing the exact same patterns across all the countries. And people were so depressed. They says, oh, what? what? We're not different? We're not totally different? I, I thought the French were totally different from the Italians. Sorry, you're not. That's the biggest lesson I've learned in 25 years is that there's so much similarity. There are so much common patterns out there uh, that organizations often willfully neglect and don't want to find. Now, you will see that Luxembourg looks a, a little bit different, but it, it's, it's small. It's smaller than Ireland, so we can ignore Luxembourg. But <laughs> so. Taking, taking the exception, and there's always an exception. There's always a 10% of weirdos who have totally different patterns, right? But 90% of the time, there's a lot of similarity. And this, uh, when we got our 70, there's 107,000 people voted uh, in the European Union, 28 countries, 24 languages. And even out of that complexity, six tasks got the first 25% of, of the vote across 107,000 people, the largest one that we have ever done, 40 uh, with at the bottom. These patterns keep repeating. There's, there's stuff that's critical and you really need to make sure it's working. There's stuff that has less uh, importance and you need to make sure that's not getting in the way of the stuff that you want to be working uh, in the process. So, of course, in these islands, we've had many centuries of conflict and disagreement that, oh, the Irish are so different from the English and et cetera, and the Welsh are different from the Scottish. But then in 2010, we did a study with uh, what was called Business Link, and we found, well, if they're actually businesses, they're all the same. Because businesses everywhere have the same needs. They're worried about their cash flow. They're worried about marketing. They're worried about productivity. They're wonder, worried about uh, funding and financing sources. And Welsh businesses do not think differently than, than Irish businesses or Scottish businesses or English businesses. So there's often this commonality that's out there, these, these common themes of what we call the top tasks. And when you uh, can discover them, it really can simplify the design process and give you a direction of, of travel on what to really focus on and what to prioritize. But organizations keep coming back to me and saying, oh, yeah, 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 you, you're focusing on the customer, but we've got to think about the organization and our, our needs and what we need to do. Well, basically, if your objectives in this day and age are different from the customer's objectives, you've got a problem, right? Uh, and you're not going to survive all th that long in a universe that has now been driven by the customer. This was the Norwegian Cancer Society, a, a charity, NGO type, a, a funded partly by the Norwegian government, but it had to get funding from the Norwegian public. And this was its website back in 2012. And it was all about, please give us money. Please give us money. You know, donations, give us your kinds, etc. So we went out and we asked uh, Norwegians, what do you want from the Norwegian Cancer Society or in dealing with cancer? You know, what really matters to you? And strangely, they didn't say giving the Norwegian Cancer Society money was one of their top tasks. Yeah, what they wanted to know was treatment, symptoms, prevention, choosing a hospital, you know, normal type of stuff. 
What was at the bottom of the list? All the donation tasks were actually at the bottom of the very bottom of the list. So everything to do with donations and giving the Norwegian Cancer Society money was at the bottom of the list. And that, was, that wasn't good news. But the Norwegian Cancer Society decided they'd do something radical. They said, let's focus on what people really want and what people need. And they created this website. No more calls for donations, you know, the major cancers. And they decided they'd create this interactive map as well of the, of the body and you could click over it, etc. And that was the first uh, website they launched uh, based on the data. They've actually refined it in the last, they've relaunched on a new uh, site recently. They're going backwards. My God, they've got rid of the interactive maps. Because you know what? A lot of the cool shit the customer doesn't use. The interactive map they didn't use, they clicked on breast cancer instead. You know, all, all of that cool stuff that senior manager go, ooh, 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 oh, let's have more of that. The customer doesn't give a shit about it. You know, like, get rid of the interactive maps. We're not interested in them. Okay, you're cool and you can do all that cool stuff. Just give us a link. Often the most radical thing is to give the customer a good, a good link in the process. So this is their, their new website going backwards. Oh, where's the innovation? You know, they're just bloody links on the page. You know, it's 1994 again, right? But anyway, there's their donations. You know, they stop asking for donations. They get a hell of a lot more because when you solve the customer's problem, they'll solve your problem. You come to a cancer website or, and it says, give me money? Yeah, or, or it says, you know, let me help you. If, it, if they help you, you're much more likely to help them. Right? But that's an extraordinarily difficult logic for organizations to ingest in this day and age. That we must serve the customer first before we can get a good return from that customer. So in developing your, your uh, customer's list of tasks, their task ecosystem. Do not start from the organization, start from the world of the customer. So if you're developing a, a health list of tasks, do not say, think about on this health website, but rather think in dealing with my health or in dealing with health. So do not think of on the Lancashire County Council website, rather think of in living in Lancashire. Get into the world of the customer, because I can guarantee you, in the world of the customer, they are not living in a channel. They are living in a house, and they are living in their own world. They are not living on Twitter. They are not living on the web. They are not living in an office or in a shop. Get into where they truly live, where is their world and their surroundings. So this was the Lancashire website. Wonderful navigation, isn't that amazing? I wonder what's behind main sections, you know? <laughs> and, and, and say, and look, do, do it online, do it online. What's the other stuff, do it offline? You know, who comes up, who comes up with these links? They must be on drugs, serious uh, type of drugs uh, in, in the process. So anyway, these were the links. No wonder they had to do a, t a top task in the process. But as we were gathering the data, we discovered that people were interested in finding out about health centers and hospitals and stuff like that. And we brought that back from the research that we had got from interviewing customers. And the council says, no, that's not us. That's the NHS. Everybody knows that's the NHS, you go there. You know, but this is, well, the data, the research from the initial customers collecting these tasks indicates that they could be interested in this. And, and we had to fight just to get it onto the list. Then we went out and we asked uh, people in Lancashire and it turned out that the number two task was hospitals. The no we said, what did they want? Number two task was, was uh, hospitals and health centers. Now, they didn't create new content, they just collaborated with the NHS to create a section. But often, what the customer wants from you, you don't even do. But you need to create some sort of a relationship to connect with that. So this is what they built, much le more logical, jobs, health and social care, waste, crime. That was about 2012, and that's what it looks like today. Tasks last. Things people do last, they have a, they have a longe uh, longevity to, to them. The ability or the way you check a symptom may change, but the need to check a symptom will be with us until the day we die. So if you get to the core drivers of the human behavior, they create a long-term structure you know, for, for, for dealing with the problem or the challenges that the customers have. 
People say, oh, we don't need to go out and do these interviews and do these analysis. We can just look at search data, etc. Search only gives you a vague sense often of what the true intent of the actual task is. Did a lot of work with Microsoft over the years, and people were searching on Microsoft Excel for remove conditional formatting. So what is the natural behavior pattern in an organization that considers itself progressive if that sort of behavior occurs? They say, oh, do we have a page for that? Oh, no, we don't. Let's create a page for it. So they created a page uh, for it. Uh, but it was getting constant negative feedback. And they, they kept changing because they were very good in Excel. They kept rewriting the page, how to remove conditional formatting. But there was never uh, satisfaction uh, for the page and never a good task completion. So they had to dig deeper uh, and understand well, what's actually happening. And what they discovered was Remove conditional format, uh, formatting was just a symptom of the problem. People would be formatting uh, conditionally in Excel, and they'd make a mess of it. And their trigger would be to remove it, but what they really wanted to do was to format conditionally well. Uh, so when they discovered, and that was the core thing, they actually deleted the page Remove Conditional Formatting. And when people searched for Remove Conditional Formatting, they gave them a page that said, Formatting in Excel, you know, Conditional Formatting, the, the A to a Z. And satisfaction went up significantly. So search often doesn't truly tell us what the task is. It's a good feed, but it's not the only feed. It's, in, it's, it's a house of complex windows, and search is just one window into human behavior. So depending only on search to understand what your customers want is not sufficient uh, in the process. So you need to look out at multiple sources to, get, to develop uh, your, your task list in the process. When you're, when you're uh, getting to the list, uh, you want to strip away everything to do with brands and everything to do with uh, organizational names. The, uh, years ago, we did the NHS, actually, and they had all these brands. They had these amazing brands called Frank. Are you on cocaine? Talk to Frank. Yeah, who comes up with that? Who, who, somebody who was on cocaine <laughs> came up with Frank, right? You know, obviously. So who comes up with Frank, right? And then there's like it is. Like it is. Like it is what? You know, oh no, we can't call it teenage pregnancy. That would be too obvious. Yeah. Or avert, oh no, maybe a, avert is about teenage pregnancy. I can't remember. There's avert, and there's like it is, and there's papyrus, whatever that is. Right? Who comes up with these things? You know, it's like, oh, it's the login. Everybody calls it login. Let's come up with something that gives people a unique experience when they visit our banking website. You know, invent, we have to strip away all the bullshit all the organizational complexity, and get to the essence of what people want to do uh, in the process. We also allocate, uh, when we're building our list, our final list of 70, typically it's about 50 to 80 uh, tasks in a, in a, for a particular environment. We usually leave about 5% of them for what we call the ego tasks. You know, the stuff that nobody's going to vote for, but you need to put it on anyway, just to prove that nobody's going to vote for it. Like, everybody gets senior management speeches and activities. Oh, the CEO got up and he's had a cup of coffee. Oh, wonderful. Everybody's watching them. Follow us on Twitter and videos and formats. Never, never have formats. Uh, web teams, etc. They, they get ex really excited. Oh, whoa, 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 watch our latest video. Oh, great. I haven't seen a video in days. I, I just, <laughs> you know, I mean, I, I can't wait to watch a video. Uh, so all that sort of stuff. You, you leave a little bit of that in just to show nobody cares about your new video, you know, in the, in the process. So what you'll also need is a, a structure. So you got your task list, and then you, you need what we call these category or uh, segmentation or demographic questions. Because you want to be able to see, is there a difference between uh, Wales and, and, and uh, England in relation to businesses and, and business needs? So this segmentation, so you need these segmentation questions. So this was the OECD, and they wanted to see, well, is there a difference from countries? And we see, or, 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 or continents, and we see, oh, broadly, 
no, not, not huge differences. A little bit of a difference between Africa. So a top task in Africa is best practice in policy implementation. It's not as much a task in other countries. So you want to be, if you want to be able to segment the data, you need these category or demographic questions. Typically, you shouldn't have more than eight of these questions, because otherwise people will start bailing out in very significant numbers. So you've got your task list and your category questions. That's a, the essence of this uh, particular survey and particular design uh, in, in the process. We also get the teams, the internal stakeholders, to do it. So when you've done your survey and you're asking people, what do you want from the OECD? Uh, create a copy of it and ask the internal stakeholders and say, what do you think our customers want? from the OECD or what do you, so you ask the internal stakeholders and we see here there's pretty good mapping overall except that internally they think that the customer is really excited about the overview of the OECD, right? They're seeing the, four, the 400 times or four times uh, more important that the internal team think that is than, than the actual customer themselves. So it's a very good way of identifying organizational blind spots of either understanding or not understanding uh, the, the customer's uh, worldview. So you've got one that you send out to the customers and then you create a copy and you ask the internal stakeholders and say, what do you think our customers really want to do, or our citizens uh, really want to do in this environment? When you get the data back, you will get these, uh, these charts of, of, of voting. And when you get a task that is significantly ahead of everything else, or maybe one or two tasks, this is what we call a super task. So it's got a way bigger vote than the other uh, stuff uh, in, in the process. Well, th this is leaning you towards this sort of a design. So this is a super task, therefore it's indicating it should dominate the design structure. But here we see this is a shorter neck, so you're getting a, uh, five or six tasks or seven or eight with relatively the same vote coming through, well, that's indicating that type of structure in the design process because not one thing is, is, is standing out. But when you get people voting in these environments, it allows you to make decisions like these or to, to get a sense of what, what really matters and is something standing out or is something getting a much higher priority uh, than others in the process. The next step once you've identified your top tasks, and in every environment, whether we're doing it for Toyota at the moment across uh, Europe, or, or, or the BBC, or IBM, or, or Microsoft, or Cisco, typically there is eight to 12 tasks that really matter in any environment. And if they're not working well, it's a poor customer experience. So what we try and do is take those eight to 12 tasks and come up with representative examples of them. So in Cisco, um, the top task is downloading software. So every six months in Cisco, we measure with network engineers. Uh, we give them the same task for the last six years, download the latest firmware for the RV over two router. So we measure, we come up with examples of the top tasks, and we measure them with, with real people. And, and the thing is consistency and repeatability. Measuring the same task over time allows you to be able to uh, see how is the environment changing, how is the performance. And we measure two things. Are people successful? Can they download the right firmware, you know, the latest firmware, and how long is it taking them? Do a lot of work with Canadian government as well. This is, you know, password, uh, uh, finding a password, uh, a passport uh, lo service location. So we see here, oh, it's 93% success, that looks good. And now it drops to 53% success. Now, something's bad there. You've got a metric. If you measure the same task over time, you, you're able to measure the environment and how it's performing and what is changing. So something went wrong here. And then it went back up to 100%. You've got a story to tell. What happened? Well, what happened was uh, they introduced interactive maps. You know, <laughs> really cool with all the dots. Because they says, hey, people want to put in their passport application. Let's show them all the passport applications we have in Canada. You know, you'd never know. Somebody in Quebec might want to drive across to Vancouver to leave in their passport. We need to show them just in case that happens. So they showed all the, the lovely maps and all the colors, and senior management were absolutely delighted because this was 
cutting edge, innovation, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But people couldn't find their local uh, uh, location to put in their passport. And they finally found that a 100% solution was just give them a bloody box. <laughs> you know, just give them a box where they can put in their postcode, 100% success rate. Often the simple has the much more powerful effect with the customer. But the complex is what the organization loves because it feeds the ego. It feeds that internal ego. Oh, we're so great, we're so complicated. Oh, look at us and the cool stuff we're doing. And the customer is just saying, eh. Yeah, you know, <laughs> next in, in the process. So if you can measure the performance of a task over time. You can begin to plan more in a way. This is a, in Cisco, a, a bug searching task, and we see, oh, it's terrible success rate. And then it jumps to 50%. Well, why does it jump to 50%? Well, it jumped to 50% because we ran a pilot. We, we had, and I, uh, by observing people, watching these network engineers, et cetera, trying to do these tasks, we were able to identify what was causing all these problems. And we said, let's run a pilot. We got a little bit of budget to run a pilot, and success jumped to 50%. And then that got the more budget to actually fix the problem. Now, the next July, the, uh, the pilot had been removed, but the, the problem, uh, the new design was being built. It was launched in July 2014, and then it went uh, to 65%, constant improvement process. But if you're measuring success and communicating success backwards, uh, uh, back uh, to, into the management pool, you begin to have a, a certain predictability of what you're actually doing in the design process. So having a way of measuring the customer outcome, identify their critical task, and then measure the performance of that task over time with the same example uh, task each time. What we discovered, how, how can you do that? In traditional usability, you need about three to eight people to identify core underlying problems. And what we've discovered after testing hundreds and thousands of people is that when you move out to between 13 and 18 people, the, the, the numbers begin to solidify. So you can say that's a 60% failure rate. Whereas with only three, if you measure three to eight people, you can say that's a problem, but you can't put any number on that problem. If you go out to about 15 people, you can be relatively certain that that's a 60% failure rate or a 40% failure rate. And if you do nothing about that, that problem and measure again in six months, it'll still be a 40% problem. That's management. That's very powerful. Now you've got a number that you can communicate uh, in relation to the actual experience. So you measure these tasks with about 13 to 18 people. You begin to have uh, stable statistics that you can communicate back. And if you make improvements, those, those success rates will go up. And you can say, oh, look at the changes we made. We simplified the form. Now the success rate has gone up uh, to 80% or whatever. So this is a lot. After we've done the top task, this is a lot of what we go to next, what we call the task performance indicator. And we're saying, oh, for this particular task, it has a 40% failure rate, and 27% uh, uh, of the time is taking between two and three minutes, et cetera. And this changes the, the dynamic of the conversation. Now the organization is focused on two critical outcomes, increasing customer success and reducing customer time. And I guarantee you, every time you increase customer success and reduce customer time, the customer behaves more positively uh, within the environment, in the process. Uh, success is getting you on the football pitch, but time wins the game. You know, all the truly successful organizations uh, today in digital are obsessed with customer time, making it easier and simpler for people to do the things that they actually need to do. So finally, Give you just a little example of here. This is a, a, a task that we tracked. Uh, the number three task, I think, in Cisco was troubleshooting. So we created a bunch of troubleshooting type uh, tasks to see how is the troubleshooting environment working. So we create these tasks and remotely, we don't do, we don't do uh, lab-based usability testing because we want to get closer to natural behavior. So using WebEx or, or GoToMeeting or whatever, you arrange a call with a, a, a typical engineer and you ask them to do these tasks and you just give them the uh, thing you want them to do and then you shut up and you just watch wh what are they doing. And if you watch 15 or so of them, you begin to see patterns and, and causes. 
So here, pretend you have forgotten the password for the Cisco account and take whatever actions are required to log in. When we measured that first, it was a 37% failure rate. That's a significant failure rate. And it was taking uh, 240 seconds. Time, how do you understand, what does 240 seconds mean? If you've got uh, time measured without some concept of what we call target time, it's very difficult to know, is that good or is that bad? So when you're, when you're measuring time, you need an optimal or a target time. So you need to agree internally, well, how long should it take to do a task like this? And we analyzed and we looked at other uh, environments, you know, ch password changes, and we saw, well, it seems that best practice and under optimal conditions, you should be able to change your password within 75 seconds. Now you can understand 240 seconds. If you don't have a target time, you can't understand actual time in the process. So when you're measuring time, you need to establish target time or optimal time for so that you've a kind of a base to compare your other time from. So it was coming in at 240 and target time uh, was 75 seconds. So the, then our job is to explain why. What's causing the 37% failure rate? What's causing the 240 uh, seconds uh, in the process? So one of the things, uh, there was a number of problems, one of the biggest problems was when they clicked on the submit button uh, at this page, it took about 30 seconds to move to the next uh, stage in the process, and that caused huge issues. Uh, so we told them, hey, that, we've got to fix that, that problem. That's a huge problem. The other was it was a very clunky process to add in your, your uh, eight alphanumeric, et cetera. And there wasn't much failure there, but it slowed people down and uh, annoyed them. So we fed these findings back to Cisco, and they took them and they started improving them. So the next time we measured, they had changed the design, the submit button was working better, and they had this little image here, password strength indicator, which was good. It was definitely an improvement, but what it was was an image, and when we, when we observed customers, we, we noticed that they were expecting it to change as they entered in their new password. So it was a step forward, but it could get better, right? But having, having said that, uh, success had now gone up uh, to 77%, time and task had gone down to 215 uh, seconds from 240. So stuff was getting better, but you never get there in digital. You're always traveling towards uh, the best uh, environment. But we told the team, we says, hey, that, that password strength indicator, good, but it could be better if it actually changed. So they adopted, added it, uh, so the next time, it began to change. So the, the next time we tested, it began to change. So in November, we were 63. In May, we were 77. In August, we were 88. And yes, we did get to 100% uh, for a while. But the next time we measured, it was down to 59% because there was a bug in the system or something uh, broke. So even when you get to 100%, you need to keep measuring the environment because digital is a constantly evolving, constantly uh, changing environment. So we measured the same task reflective of the top task over time. And that becomes a key management model, where instead of us measuring what the organization is doing uh, and what the organization is producing, we are measuring the outcome. The shift today in, in the world of management is away from managing and measuring organizational outputs and moving towards uh, measuring customer outcomes. Digital creates a bridge between the organization and the customer, allows us to become part of the customer's world, to observe the customer's world in a way that we could never observe in, in a physical world or was extremely difficult. And we can find out much more how they are actually behaving, whether they are successful, whether they are not, whether they are uh, taking a lot of time, or whether they are not. So the, the model of top task is really trying to find out what truly matters to the customer and then measuring those things and optimizing those things. And when you're measuring and optimizing those things, then you've got a justification for the focus on the critical stuff and not to be pulled and dragged away from that minor, less important, uh, tiny task stuff. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much.